Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today, my guest is Christine Boyden, the Chief Communications Officer at General Motors Robo Taxi subsidiary called Cruise. Cruise is valued at $30 billion. They have launched in San Francisco earlier this year, and we are talking about how Christine has helped transition this brand from R&D to a commercial product. We are talking about how to talk about self-driving and how to launch a new category. Please enjoy Christine Boyden. Christine, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Where are you calling in from in the world today? You know what? I'm in the Castro neighborhood of San Francisco. Oh, perfect, because that's exactly where you where your cars are floating around. Um, for those listening and watching the podcast that don't know what Cruise is, can you share uh, the history of Cruise? Sure. So Cruise is a self-driving car company. We're based and headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, We're there because we actually believe that solving one of the most difficult driving cities um, is the best place to start. And if you can tackle San Francisco driving, you can tackle just about anywhere. Cruise's history, we're about eight years old, and um, we are now majority owned by General Motors. And we have been working on this since our visionary CEO um, founded the company, but has always had a passion for robotics. He started participating in robotics contests when he was about 14 and um, then went on to uh, be one of the founders of Twitch and then came back when he believed that the technology was closer to being ready to really pursue his lifelong passion of self-driving. And with the intent of making a more sustainable, more affordable, more accessible transportation option, given just the horrendous status quo, Um, about 40,000 people die a year just in the United States by traffic accidents. That's not even counting the life-changing injuries that happen um, every day. So that's what we're up to. We now have... Driverless operations where you can hail a robo-taxi at night, um, most nights of the week in San Francisco. And then we have driverless delivery in Walmart, and we have a toehold of beginning operations in Austin, Texas. Yeah, preparing for this interview today, Christine, I read that more Americans have died in traffic crashes than in fighting all of the past wars, which was pretty shocking to me. Um, <clears throat> to yeah. understand self-driving, I mean, there's a lot of investment. There's been over $10 billion invested since 2010, but it's not an easy business. And when you look at the companies that have really tried to make their mark, many have failed. Um, Cruise has not. What is it that makes GM's Cruise different that you're so resilient and, and you have not given up where so many others just seem to be giving up on the, this difficult fight of self-driving vehicles? Sure. Well, I think one aspect of it is we have phenomenal partners and GM has been a phenomenal partner and investor. We are wholly aligned with them. They, a number of years ago, rolled out their vision of zero, 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 which zero emissions, zero crashes and zero congestion. And that alignment and um, shared vision really matters. The other thing that I think really sets us apart is that we are singularly focused on self-driving. And we have a behavior that we refer to as stay focused and cruise. And just that singular mindset of tackling what we see as the hardest engineering challenge of a generation. And, you know, some days I feel like I'm in some wonderful, amazing sort of Willy Wonka meets NASA, you know, in terms of IQ per capita, but meets the creativity and that just singular, almost moonshot, we need to put this person on the moon and, you know, save these folks' lives. Um, We had a moment the other day where Secretary uh, Buttigieg, you know, really highlighted that the status quo is so broken and that there's no other industry that would allow this. But here we are, and I think that's something that gets cruisers, what we call our employees, up every single day. 
And what is amazing is we have off the chart commitment to the mission. And I think, again, bringing it back to that amazing partner and GM and the alignment of vision, incredible, incredible talent who are singularly focused and believe so deeply in the mission. We couldn't be higher in terms of benchmarks with other companies um, in the world in terms of our talent's commitment to what we're doing. So Christine, people tune into this podcast to hear about customer experience. So it would be interesting to hear what kinds of research and studies and insights you're doing into the customer experience of a driverless taxi. Sure. Well, we've done all manner of studies, as you can imagine. Um, The most compelling right now that we have, and I think most interesting to your listeners, is our early riders. And what is extraordinary is for a long time, only cruise um, employees could take the cars. And we would feel this magical joy once we um, got in and were taking rides. But we didn't know if that was really going to translate in the same way. You know, obviously we're bought in and we believe in, you know, the future of self-driving. And, you know, over the past year, when we actually have been able to include the public, include um, cruisers' parents and families and friends, we are seeing the same thing happen where people get in and they're very nervous and they're like, oh my gosh, and you see the steering wheel move and you're like, even I take them almost every week and the first few minutes I sort of giggle like a schoolgirl. And then what is amazing is that then they become completely bored to the point where we had to, you know, adopt, you know, radio opportunities and trivia opportunities because it changes so quickly from that novelty to, oh my gosh, this is so boring. We say brilliantly boring all the time to the point where you won't believe this, Blake, 96% of our riders get out of the car and say that they trust crews and want to ride in it again and Mm -hmm. feeling that complete sense of safety. The other thing that we're finding is, you know, we really went in with this mission, obviously, around safety and physical safety, not only for the rider, but for pedestrians and cyclists and the communities, you know, that we operate in and serve. What has been a huge aha of the research and continues to play out in a really fascinating way is the psychological safety Mm -hmm. that people feel when they're riding because it's wholly their own space. And in particular, currently what we would call transportation insecure or vulnerable populations who, especially at night, can feel really uncomfortable, be it public transportation, be it ride share. And these aha moments of I get to wholly own this space, wholly be myself. I don't have to edit who I am. And that really has been a huge unlock in terms of the way that we think about the opportunity and the experience. And it just really, you know, resonated with me and, you know, most women I've talked to, Right. that feeling of when you're in a situation, I mean, we all know the sort of creepy look in the, you know, rear view mirror or, oh, you know, I'm going to call my husband or whatever else happens. And that's true for women, people of color, LGBTQ. And that research is coming through so loudly and clearly um, that it's almost overwhelming that we have this opportunity not only to help physical safety, but that psychological safety that we didn't even fully appreciate as we went into this mission. Absolutely. That's something that I think most of us wouldn't think about unless we've been in that situation. And unfortunately, many of us have been in that situation. Um, Let's talk about you coming into this role as chief communications officer. I saw you were president of Edelman West for a really long time, and you're an expert communicator. What does it take to convince a a city of people to take a chance on something? Obviously, San Francisco, you're dealing with a very tech-savvy citizen that are used to software, but that's a tough thing to do. So when you came into the role, how did you even set out to begin chipping away at this difficult task of educating people, not just selling them on cruise, but educating them on what it is? Sure. So you brought up Edelman and I spent many moons there, of course. And those who know Edelman know uh, the trust barometer. 
Yes. <laughs> and I had, <laughs> right? It's almost synonymous. And I had the benefit of being a student of trust and the trust barometer all of those years. And one of the things that really attracted me to Cruise was the founder and CEO would say, it's even more of a trust race than it is a tech race. Mm. And one of the ways that we've had um, good success, it's, it's an ongoing process, it's an ongoing education, is really grounded in one of the key insights of the trust barometer, which is people trust people like themselves more than anything. And with so many institutions and don't need to, you know, belabor this point going into the elections of misinformation and other crisis with traditional trusted institutions, people more than ever really rely on someone that they can relate to and who has had an experience that they see themselves in. Mm -hmm. And that really has informed a lot of the work that we're doing in terms of getting our community members, talking to them, giving them the experience, and being really honest about the challenges that the AV category has faced. And while San Francisco in particular is extraordinarily savvy when it comes to tech, they've also seen some of the worst of it, right? Yeah. So there is some of that tech backlash. And so we needed to work extra hard in terms of coming to the city, being humble with the city. One of the first pieces of content that I was you know, extraordinarily proud of was this piece we did called Poppy in the City. And it was this little piece that really showed over the years, Poppy, our spokes vehicle, learning how to drive. And it almost went through that entire arc of coming of age, like I don't know if you have kids, but teaching them how to drive and seeing them go from really nervous and you're sort of white knuckling to gaining confidence, gaining expertise, gaining, you know, all of those things that you need to manage navigating a really complex city environment. Mm -hmm. And it really brought some humanity to the conversation because we weren't trying to just say speeds and fees and whiz bang and trust us. We were showing that this was just like you the first time you were learning to drive in a city had to go through that same process. And we're honest about like, yeah, sometimes we were annoying and sometimes we paused too long and sometimes we were overly cautious, but look at this progression and we are going to continue to be honest and open with you as we, you know, go through that progression. And we've had our humble moments, but whenever we face them, being truthful, not hiding behind, um, you know, sort of jazz hands and obfuscation of don't worry, it's just technology and it's going to save the world, but really talking about what is behind it and what the AV is learning to do just like we would. So something that many of us are thinking about when we think about GM's involvement with Cruise is that GM makes cars that aren't self-driving and yet they're investing in this self-driving arm so how does that work? What mm -hmm. is it like to work with them when you're, you are potentially disrupting, they're disrupting their own company? Well, I have to say it's inspiring. I, you know, came to Silicon Valley in 1999 and I've seen a lot of companies come and go. And a lot of those companies that were the hot companies when I arrived here in the Bay Area were companies that became arrogant and, you know, really rested on their laurels and didn't believe that the next startup or other company could come in and disrupt them easily. And I have to say, Mary Barra continues to be one of the most inspiring leaders I've ever had the privilege to work with. And the fact that they realized that not only all electric, but that self-driving was required in order to transform transportation and make these big bets has just been nothing short of extraordinary. I think when I think about working with GM, it's one of our biggest differentiators because not only do they believe in self-driving, but we're working with them on a purpose-built vehicle. And that's a really wonderful way to work together because we will have what's called the origin. And it is no steering wheel, no pedals, just built for the customer, wholly for the customer. It is campfire seating. 
You have tremendous leg room. It is wholly your customizable space. And that shared purpose of benefiting from their 100 plus years of manufacturing excellence with our technology, it really feels like the best of Detroit and the best of Silicon Valley coming together to help transform what is currently this terrible status quo of transportation today. And that alignment of expertise and vision, it just, it's, it's really hard to beat. And I think going back to one of your original questions, I think that continues to be one of the things that puts crews ahead and differentiates us in a way that a lot of other of the AV category has a hard time competing with. So let's talk about timeline. Um, Many predict that eventually all cars will be self-driving, but that seems to be a distant dream, North Star. So what are you tracking, predicting for when we'll just walk outside and every car will be self-driving? You know, I... I don't have that crystal ball. I think, though, and I'll date myself, long ago and far away, one of my first clients um, was Palm. If you remember Palm Pilots and mm-hmm. Trio smartphones and, and all the rest. And I remember, you know, as a young professional Italian people, mobile was going to be big. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everybody would say, like, I don't want to be tethered to my work. I don't want to be reached on a phone. I don't want, you know, and there was a litany of you know, excuses as to why that was a terrible idea and reasons why it would never really work or remain just something that was like very narrow and executive jewelry. And then it wasn't that long later, and of course the iPhone and others, you know, came into the category where it just felt like it was something that was talked about forever. And then almost overnight it was ubiquitous. And I think we're going to reach a tipping point in a few years, and we'll see how many of those years are within that few, where a few cities see the power of what self-driving and all electric does to unlock a city and really support a community. And we'll then we'll start to see rapid scaling and rapid adoption in a way that will be hard to believe at the time, but then we'll take for granted. Well, that's awesome. I, I love that idea. Do you think that the next iteration of self-driving and the customer experience will look a bit different? Like, what what are some of your predictions on how it might evolve, considering some of the limitations today? Sure. I mean, some of the things we talk about, and you know, spe- you know, have to talk about the customer here. We're completely customer obsessed at Cruise. Is when I talk about the origin, you know, right now everybody sees our little Chevy Bolts, which are lovely and, you know, endearing on so many levels. Um, They all have names. But the origin is really when it gets serious, where we can completely transform instead of the backseat of a Bolt into this campfire seating where you have tons of room. Like two NBA players can put their legs out. We had Mm -hmm. them at an event. And, like, it's sort of amazing when you think about just totally owning that space because nothing's being taken up by the engine or the trunk or the steering wheel and the pedals. And so we were doing, you know, all these fun experiences with like, what if you get in and you want Zen mode or party mode and you could really choose how you want that cabin to become your personalized space or customize it. So you almost have a profile of when you're in that mode, what music do you want to hear? What kind of lighting even, you know, who knows? Um, but I think that is going to become the future where that cabin becomes your own. And then it's also who you're riding with. You know, maybe you're catching up with your son or daughter after a day of school. And instead of being half distracted and trying to pay attention and be a responsible driver, you're just able to fully engage with them Mm -hmm. and have that conversation and that total focus where that time becomes not half spent with them, but fully spent and fully present. Or maybe that's just the time that you need to like relax so that you can be a better parent when you do get home. Yes. But, or it could be, and you know, for those nights out to not have to worry about who's driving or if your driver is drunk or distracted or they've been on a long shift or they've had a fight with their partner And you just can, you know, turn up the music and completely enjoy and sort of get ready for whatever sort of adventure you're going to go into next. Yeah, I love that. It makes sense. And I hope that I hope that the self-driving forecasting comes sooner rather than later, because, yes, I am very terrified of 
the rate of auto accidents. And I just moved to LA from the Bay Area recently. So, I mean, oh, nice. we work from home. So I feel like that's like the best thing you can do is not have to drive a lot. Um, but I'm so happy that you came on the show to talk about what Cruz is doing. And maybe this time next year, we can catch up again and hear more about progress made. Um, I wanted to close with some. Well, I'm like, I would like to give you a standing invitation. Anytime you want to come to San Francisco, we're not in LA yet, obviously, but you are welcome to come take a ride with me and see for yourself. Oh, okay. there, it really, unless you experience it, it just sounds like I'm talking about crazy stuff. But once you experience it, it is just extraordinary. And you believe that the future is here and coming and it's going to be so much better than the status quo today. I'm so happy to hear that. Christine, let's do some rapid fire fun. Are you ready? As ready as I'll ever be, I suppose. Okay. First question. What did you eat for breakfast today? Oh, I wasn't a good girl today. I had just English breakfast tea. Okay. Um, What is your idea of perfect happiness? You know, I'm, I'm pretty simple. I am still one of those people who's completely smitten kitten in love with my husband. I think my husband, a good meal, good travel, good book, good wine, good music. And like, I am happy. All right. What is one mental health strategy for managing hard days? You know what? I, (laughs) it's a constant joke in my house. When I've had a really hard day, I love to cook. And Mm -hmm. I will make, you know, sort of the type A overachiever meal because somehow that act of chopping and preparing and not being able to look at my phone and just, you know, being all consumed by one task, it's very meditative for me. Mm -hmm. And then I also love, you know, fiction. Anytime I can escape to somebody else's world um, and leave mine behind for a little bit really also helps. On a related note, what is your favorite type of vacation? I love exploring a new culture and just immersing myself in it and been really lucky to travel all over the world for my career, but also personally and truly finding those little ahas and those little moments and new foods and new music and things that I never would have found, um, you know, sitting at home. If you could have lunch with anybody dead or alive, who would it be? There's so many. I will, I'll tell you proximity and uh, recency bias, but um, I'm completely obsessed right now with Leonora Carrington, the surrealist artist and painter Mm -hmm. who was um, just extraordinary and way before her time as a feminist, um, broke through all sorts of the surrealist movement and norms, and then fled to Mexico um, and lived in Mexico City after World War II. And then was one of the pioneering and founding members of the women's liberation within Mexico. And I just would love to sit down with her and talk about all that happened in all of those years, as well as sort of a pioneer in women's rights long before it was cool. Wow. That it sounds like you recently read a book about her or something. I did. <laughs> okay. Um, if you had my to... new best friend, Blake. Yes. I, I'm going to have to check that book out. If you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, what would it be? healthy optimism with a huge dose of pragmatism. Very good. I like that. Well, this has been so fun having you on the show, Christine. If people want to learn more about riding in a cruise car, how would they do so? They can go to getcruise.com, our website, and there is a sign up and wait list if they want to experience it. Right now, San Francisco, uh, Phoenix, and Austin, and hopefully more cities soon. And uh, Blake, I really hope to welcome you to San Francisco for a ride as well. All right, Christine, I would love that. Well, thank you for joining me on the Modern Customer Podcast. Everybody tuning in until next time. 